go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're connecting from. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar on e-mobility solutions presented by the Green Energy Team in the Information and Technology Management from UNDP in Copenhagen. So this common service webinar and the service is part of the high impact common services, um, opportunities to drive impact through operations. My name is Luis Diego Cobb. I work with UNDCO in the country business strategy. And before we get started, I wanted to go through a few housekeeping my presentation allows. Um, so first of all, I'd like to give a brief visual description of myself to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible to everyone. So I'm a Latinx person. I have short black hair. I'm looking quite sleepy at this hour in the morning, wearing a white shirt, as I mentioned, and black, um, sorry, white background. So that's why I'm so sleepy. Um, and feel free to ask any questions also in the chat box. We have colleagues that are gonna be attending it. At the end of the webinar, also you have an opportunity to raise your hand and mute yourself and ask a question directly. There will also be a chance to interact with some questions um, during a poll, during the presentation. And there will also be a survey link that we will be sharing with you. Um, so that you can let us know how we did, how we can improve, and how we can make these webinars more and more useful for you. If you would like captioning, um, you can go to the CC um, icon on your screen or the ellipses, the three dots, and just enable transcription or live captioning. Um, so with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. So we're going to have Paula Martinez Corradiza um, and Peter Lucis, who are green energy engineers from the green energy team in the information and technology management at UATP in Copenhagen. And we're also joined by Shetiso Nieti, who is the global team lead for the green energy. So with that, I'd like to start um, giving a brief overview of the high impact common services. Many of you might have seen this several times, um, but just uh, to emphasize um, the role that operations can lead in high impact in advancing the 2030 agenda. So the high impact common services were selected um, by several criteria. Um, number one, um, there are services that have a high cost avoidance. So services that have high efficiencies with collaboration and the cost factors. Um, another factor is the high quality improvement so services that can really improve um, the delivery of the service themselves, whether it's in volume or in speed uh, or in quality itself. Um, and then the other one are either good practices from agencies, entities that are already practicing or perfected um, and demonstrated a proof of concept in the service, or they have a linkage with the SDGs. Um, so I'll, in a minute, I'll show the different high impact common services that are available. So from the high cost avoidance, there's the top 10 um, services. Um, from innovative and good practices, we have a, a whole series or suite of services from innovative solutions from digital booking, management of fleet. Um, I would say that also this e-mobility is, is a good practice from an entity, in this case, UNDP. And it also has um, linkage with the SDGs and social impact, which is the other group of services, as well as enabling and um, promoting sustainable and renewable practices. Um, so it's really cut across several of these categories. Um, just in a, at a glance, these are the top 10 um, services, which as you can see also have um, 380 million in cost avoidances. Um, and you can look at these in your BOSS annual review or in the dashboard in the BOSS online platform as well. And then on the right, you're gonna see the services with either high quality or social impact. So we have a whole set of um, disability inclusion services from physical accessibility, inclusive HR, um, ICT accessibility. Um, then we have the innovation and efficiency, a lot of it with digital booking, which I mentioned, um, some offered by WFP, UNHCR, um, and a few other services as well. And you can look at them and I'll share the link of the resources there. There's a, a suite of green and energy renewable, renewable energy services. Um, a lot of them with solar panels, um, the ones that we're seeing today with e-mobility and so forth. Um, 
then gender responsive operations, so supporting women-owned businesses, um, gender parity strategy, um, and then enabling environments as well. So we've had webinars on sustainable canteen, inclusive working environments, and you can access all the um, high impact common services practice notes. So there's practice notes to help you implement these, as well as webinar recordings on the YouTube channel. And I'll share the links in a second. Um, so one of the things that we've done to, to support implementation is to provide seed funding for proof of concept. So we're working with about 16 countries with the ITM team, um, implementing um, proof of concept by creating this business case. So basically, um, the ITM team comes and does an assessment of uh, the premises, um, the availability to install the solar solutions, what would be the benefits, the ROI, the investment um, needed to facilitate um, that next step of securing the funding to be able to implement. So the idea is to remove that barrier so that you can um, implement those solutions. If you'd like to do that in, in one of your common premises, reach out to us. There's still funding available for us. And then in disability inclusion, these are some of the countries that we've been working with. Um, these, are, these are only 11. We're working with about 15 or 16 at the moment. And as I mentioned, we have availability for a few more. And then as far as in disability inclusion, we're also implementing seed funding with 10 to 15 countries. Um, we've started the rollout and it'll go through December of this year, 2022. Um, and it'll be implementing services along these three areas of physical accessibility, making the premises accessible so persons with disabilities can access, can work um, freely in our, in our premises. And we could also set a gold standard in a sense where governments, private sector organizations can also aim to have those high levels of accessibility. Making ICT and digital accessibility more and more, um, that's the way that we work. Our virtual platform meetings, how we're connected today, need to be accessible as well. Um, and the idea is to be able to create an inclusive HR environment, both in our culture and in the recruitment practices so that persons with disabilities can be employed and the UN can hopefully represent uh, the percentage of persons with disabilities in the world, which is 15% in our workforce as well. Um, so with that brief overview and quick overview, I'll hand it over to Paula, who will go straight into the presentation. So Paula, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Luis Diego. Let me just share my screen. I hope everyone can hear me well and can see my screen. We can. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Luis Diego, for the opportunity presenting today here. First of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. Um, as you know, for the last couple of years, there has been an increase in efforts towards the UN fleet electrification, bringing the UN a step closer to achieving the SDGs and also the 2030 agenda. So as Luis Diego mentioned before, the idea of this webinar would be to provide with a brief presentation on the e-mobility new service line that is offered in the DOS platform giving you first a quick introduction, very uh, quick on technical uh, concepts. Then we will be uh, explaining the process that UNDP ITM proposes. And then at the end, we will conclude with uh, an overview of the first pilot project that we developed in this context in collaboration with UNDP and UNICEF in Namibia. First of all, I would also like to introduce myself and also to be aligned with uh, how Luis Diego uh, introduced himself. My name is Paula Martinez. I'm green energy engineer with the green energy team of ITM UNDP based in Copenhagen. I'm uh, Spanish, uh, blonde hair and blue eyes. And uh, right now I'm based here in Copenhagen. Um, it's very weird because it's kind of sunny. So you might be able to see some uh, light entering through my window. Um, but yeah, that would be everything from my side. I also have here my colleagues, uh, Peter and Shati. So we will be conducting this webinar uh, on behalf of UNDP Information and Technology Management Unit in uh, Copenhagen. And as I mentioned before, part of ITM, we are the Green Energy team. Uh, our mission is to provide UNDP country offices, but also other UN agencies and external organizations with 
green energy uh, solutions and also smart facilities to support uh, these partners in addressing electricity supply challenges and also moving towards a more sustainable and greener future. Our vision is very much aligned with UNDP uh, mission and is to create smart UN facilities to build local capacity and inspire a movement. To address some of the challenges that uh, UN cities might be facing, the ITM unit proposes the creation of the smart facilities with the goal of interconnecting smart technologies and people in the track of social and economic uh, development. We can see here in the quadrant a summarized model compiling the main pillars that constitute the smart facility vision that I was mentioning before. The quadrant in the upper left uh, summarizes the main solution to address challenges on energy and mobility, such as providing uh, solutions for renewable energy production and electric mobility. The quadrants in the right summarizes solutions suggested to address security and infrastructure challenges, gathering multiple kind of ICT solutions designed specifically for these purposes. But we also know that uh, making products available for only purchase was not enough anymore. So here is when the big data and the internet of things came into place to make us able to monitor and measure the deployment of all these products, ensuring the, uh, the quality of the performance. Before uh, moving forward with the presentation, uh, now I'm gonna kindly ask uh, Luis Diego to, to please uh, display the question, the first question. We are just gonna try to see uh, how familiar are you right now with e-mobility solutions? It's a multiple uh, choice question. So um, either you already uh, have purchased a plug-in hybrid or an electric vehicle, you are in the process of procuring one, you have attended already webinars, conferences, but haven't started uh, with the implementation of these solutions, or you are not very familiar about uh, this topic. So we are gonna leave some time for the responses. It seems so far, the majority of the cases either have attended uh, webinars and conferences or are not very familiar with the topic yet. So this is gonna be a very good opportunity to get to know a bit more. But some of you, um, I'm, I'm very happy to see that already have an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid. I'm gonna end the poll and uh, we can move forward with the presentation. So before presenting to you the um, proposed methodology and the tools that we will be using for electric mobility implementation, as I mentioned before, we would like to briefly introduce you with the technology. Transformation can happen very fast. As you can see in the recent year, there has been enormous technology transformation. In the following images, uh, you could see how the Fifth Avenue looked the same day, but 13 years apart. In 1900, all you could see were horse-drawn carriages and only one combustion vehicle. However, 13 years later in 1913, on the same day and the same place, means of transportation really changed and you could only see one horse out of all the internal combustion engines. So really the point is here that transformation can happen very fast and we need to be ready for this. There are different modalities of electric vehicles and it's important to understand the main differences when making a decision. On one hand, we have uh, hybrid vehicles, which have both a gas power engine and an electric motor to drive the car. But this last one is used only to assist the gas power engine. And in order to charge this battery, it is done through what is called the regenerative braking. The range that this kind of vehicles can drive, it's uh, in all electric mode is very limited, often just for a few kilometers. Therefore, the greenhouse gas emission reduction that we could expect will be only a very small portion. Same family, but slightly different. We have the plug-in hybrid uh, vehicles that like regular hybrids, they can recharge their battery through regenerative braking. But the difference is that they are able to be plugged into the grid as well. Also, they have much uh, larger battery. Therefore, they can drive for 
higher range, which can be very suitable for those countries with lack of charging infrastructure or that are uh, willing to replace one of their fuel emission vehicles. And finally, we can find the battery electric vehicles, which are commonly known as electric vehicle. They are pure uh, electric vehicles, only powered by electricity and doesn't have any petrol engine. And of course, this would be the preferable option whenever this is feasible. We need electric vehicles, uh, but that is not enough. And here is when the concept of e-mobility becomes particularly important. But what is e-mobility? E-mobility, which is uh, electric mobility, is not only about electric vehicles and charging infrastructure, but also about the interconnection of the technology with many other different aspects. E-mobility has been shaped as the core element for the sustainable development and connects not only this technology that I was mentioning before, electric vehicles and charging station, but also connects energy markets, regulations, standards, economics, and the EV owner itself. It is important to keep in mind that electric vehicles are not emissions free, and they can have their own environmental impact depending on how they are charged and how they are manufactured. And that's why EVs must be fueled with green energy uh, renewable sources. And here is when the concept of PGI comes into play because it will make the charging more efficient, more sustainable and more financial and environmentally friendly. But what is really BGI? BGI is also known as vehicle grid integration and it's a technology that allows this interconnection between what I was explaining before, the core concept of e-mobility, also renewable energy sources and the electric grid. But no worries because we are gonna see it now more in detail and we are gonna go through the main technological aspects. BGI encompasses the many ways in which a vehicle can provide benefits or services to the grid, to the society, and also to the EV drivers by optimizing the vehicle interaction with the electricity grid, with the building, with renewable energy sources, and also with the charging infrastructure. BGI includes both uh, unidirectional and bidirectional vehicle charging. And as you can see in the, di in the diagram below, you can see both examples. In green, uh, we have unidirectional charging in which the electric vehicle is directly connected to the charging infrastructure and this last one to the grid. It's just one way uh, charging. That's why it's called unidirectional. And in red, you can see bidirectional charging, both ways uh, charging in which in this specific example, the EV is not just connected to the grid, but also it's connected to the building being able to store energy in the battery of the electric vehicle to after sell it back to the grid or supply it to the compound, replacing the more expensive energy coming from the grid. And here in this last picture, what I'm trying to show is that the benefits of vehicle grid integration can really impact directly, not only the EV driver, the EV owner, but also it can impact the building, the neighborhood or even a whole region. And based on what was presented, here is the pathway for vehicle grid integration implementation divided into different steps. BGI zero is also known as grid compliant charging or informally also you might have heard dam charging and it has no advanced features and everything is managed by the user manually. Then we have B1G, that we call it also smart charging, which is the most feasible option right now, given the market conditions and also the technology evolution. It is uh, unidirectional, so one way charging, but could control the charging time and the charging rate based on financial uh, and monetary drivers. It can optimize the utilization of green energy uh, sources or can ensure load balancing in the building, which can be one of the biggest challenges whenever we are connecting an electric vehicle to the electrical system. And then uh, we can move to the bidirectional charging uh, buckets where we can find two different options. So the first option is V2V, which is uh, known as vehicle to building, and it's able to push energy back to the, to the building 
to replace the more expensive energy coming from the grid. And we also have a bit more advanced V2G, which is vehicle to grid, that fulfills functions that go beyond the customer's own energy system and is able to push energy back uh, from the vehicle, from the battery of the vehicle to the grid. Due to the current uh, market conditions and also the lack of uh, regulations in place, these last ones, uh, V2B and V2G, um, might be a bit challenging to implement for this year in the context that we are targeting right now, but definitely will be something to explore in the next year, 2023. Before moving into the process that ITM proposes for the implementation of e-mobility solutions, Maybe Luis Diego, you can uh, display the next question, which basically uh, is just to get to know which kind of barriers do you think are the, the, the most important one in your country whenever we are talking about implementation of electric vehicles. Lack of uh, local electric vehicle or charging station suppliers, lack of uh, charging infrastructure, lack of awareness or lack of uh, funding availability. We are gonna uh, leave a bit more time for everyone to answer. And I can see that most of you uh, already selected the second one, which is lack of uh, charging infrastructure. Indeed, this is one of the main barriers in uh, emerging countries for the implementation of e-mobility solutions. Also lack of local EV suppliers is one of the main ones as well. Maybe uh, we can, thank you so much, Luis. Uh, I can move to the next slide. So in the context of creating smart facilities, the Green Energy team has put in place a very well-defined uh, seven-step process known a seven-step green energy solution, which has been recognized as best practice by UNSDG for solar implementation. This implementation process is the core of the green energy team. And in a nutshell, it is an end-to-end -end process in the sense that it covers every step from the data collection all the way to the implementation of the solution. This process has been very well received among the different partners having now more than uh, 100 projects in our pipeline across the different steps of our process. Part of our commitment with the SDGs, the, two, uh, the 2030 agenda and the internal UNDP goals, the ITM Green Energy team uh, decided to align this seven step process for the implementation of the mobility projects and the migration to greener and more sustainable vehicle fleets. In the next slides, we are now going to go more into detail with each of the different uh, stages, explain the tools and the methodology that is behind. The first step uh, called vehicle utilization and assessment is basically where we gather all the data that we need to build the business case. To do so, uh, we rely on mainly an in-house developed self-assessment application called the Green Energy Preliminary Site Survey, which is basically a survey that we send to the end users to be filled with all the necessary information that we need for the business case development. You can see a screenshot of uh, this application and some of the key aspects that we collect and later an analyze more in detail are, for example, uh, fleet characteristics, such as the type of internal combustion engines used or the mileage cover, local market uh, available, parking space for the installation of the charging station, and so on and so forth. If the electric vehicle market is solid and offers different options, um, what we recommend is to conduct a local tender, but we are gonna go through the procurement aspect later on. So part of uh, step one, ITM will be supporting and conducting market research in collaboration with the UNCT's procurement team, just to get insights into the local market uh, possibilities for electric vehicle provision. Once several companies or several dealers have been identified, we will be sharing a questionnaire with those uh, companies, like the one that you can see on the screen, 
just to make sure that these suppliers will be in a position to provide the products and the services that we are expecting, such as training or after sales service. At this stage, the questionnaire will only include very open and general questions just to understand better the supplier's position once the official procurement process is launched. With this information, we will be able to analyze the local conditions and predefine uh, the solution requirements according to the UNCT's needs, expectations, and also constraints. And once we have all the solid foundation for our business case, then we can move to the next step, which is step two. Our business case basically is a technical, economic, and environmental analysis that we developed to allow the end users to make a well-informed decisions on the solution to be acquired. The assessment conducted to deliver this business case is based on in-house developed tools, like the one that you can see on the screen, to estimate and uh, to estimate cost and also expected financial and environmental savings resulting from this solution. In the business case, we will provide all the necessary support and information to define the option that best fits uh, the UNCT needs and expectations. And once uh, we have the green light to continue, then we move to step three to the procurement process. This uh, diagram uh, that you can see here is the strategy that ITM uh, suggests to put in place based also on advice and feedback from different parties such as UNDP procurement service units. But what I'm here presenting are just initial plans that will be determined and confirmed at a later stage once the UNCT decide to engage with us. Since we will need to acquire uh, two different equipment, uh, two different procurement processes will be, in most of the cases, uh, be running separately. On the one hand, we have the electric vehicles, uh, which uh, could the procurement could be done in two different uh, modalities, could be either local procurement or through UNDP LTA or any other existing LTAs. If the local procurement, uh, if the local market story is solid uh, with different options that previously should have been assessed as we have already seen, what we recommend is conducting a local procurement process to ensure that we obtain best value for money for which ITM as well will be supporting in different tasks that we will see in the next slide. In those cases where the in-country market doesn't offer many options or even no options at all, then the use of the UNDP LTA or any other existing LTAs that the UNCT could uh, piggyback on, then this option is recommended. The only challenge is that UNDP LTA would work in some specific locations and also the electric vehicle model uh, offer might not meet the UNCT's needs in terms of size and proposals. But it's something, of course, that we can explore and we can discuss more in detail whenever reaching that step. Then uh, for the electric vehicle supply equipment for the charging station, again, we will have also two different options, local or open international procurement process. Advanced and innovative options for charging stations. Remember that our objective would be to implement smart charging. That might be a bit limited in the local market or even non-existent. So if we confirm that these options uh, are aligned with the smart charging that we are planning to implement, then a uh, local procurement process would be definitely something that we can explore. Although in most of the cases, this option might be a bit challenging, and that's why UNDP is exploring the option of launching an open international procurement process in order to select a vendor that could support UNCTs with the shipment, the training, and the installation of this smart charging equipment. If the procurement process is conducted without the use of any LTAs, then from our side, ITM will be supporting drafting a well-defined tender document for both the electric vehicle and the charging station, keeping in mind all the requirements that must be included, such as wiring or any specific civil works for the charging infrastructure. BIDES conference and site visit could be also organized by ITM and conducted by the interested bidders just to ensure high quality of their received proposal, but just whenever this is really necessary. 
And finally, uh, our team, we will be also supporting with the evaluation of all the offers received to ensure uh, best value for money through the entire process. After we have already selected a vendor and the supplier has been awarded, then we will request this winning vendor to carry out a detailed site survey to gather all the measurements and all the electrical information necessary for the charging station installation. We will also provide uh, some guidelines uh, to the vendor just to facilitate the data collection during the site survey. Then once this site survey has been already conducted by the winning vendor, we move to the step five, in which the vendor will need to submit the site survey report, which will be reviewed by our team to ensure that everything is in place and ready for the installation. Along with the site survey report that the vendor has to provide, the selected vendor also will need to draft the final technical design of the facility including any constructions or any electrical plans, if that's applicable, taking into consideration all the different details and all the different findings from the site survey that has been performed before. As part of the technical oversight, ITM must endorse this final charging station design before the actual installation starts, just to make sure that the works are compliant with all the technical requirements that were uh, listed and included in the procurement process run before. And once this proposal is approved, then we move to the step six, which comprises many different sub stages. When it comes to the actual installation, it only refers to the charging station, of course, in which the vendor will be engaged to support during this installation works. Once the equipment is installed and the user acceptance test has been performed both for the electric vehicle and for the charging equipment, then the vendor will be providing training to the local staff, could be either online or on site, just to warranty that this will also serve uh, for local capacity building purposes. The training will be basically on how to drive the car, how to charge it, and basic troubleshooting in case this is needed. And also a part of step, step six, uh, we would like to highlight that communication efforts are very important through the entire process, but specifically during the installation and all sorts of communication materials can be developed during this step. This is also very important because in the end, our goal is not only to provide green energy solutions to the different locations, but in order to fulfill the smart facilities vision that we were presenting before, we really want these projects to be advertised so they can serve as showcases inspire a movement among the local community. And here you can see some examples of uh, communication materials that were developed for the pilot project in Namibia that we are gonna see later. And finally, we reach step seven, which is the operation and maintenance of the system. The key aspect of this step is that uh, general repairs and general checkups will have to be provided by the supplier of the electric vehicle as it was requested in the terms of reference. And regarding the charging station, most probably there won't be the need for any kind of maintenance because it's a plug and play solution. Although each case will be analyzed very much into detail to see if this service will be needed or not. This should be performed always through local dealers present in the city or in the region not only to ensure prompt response if something happens, but also to ensure the development of local capacity. In addition, as part of uh, operation and maintenance step, our team will also provide lifetime long monitoring of the solution through an online portal that should have been provided by the supplier. And also we will be developing uh, KPI re reports just to follow up on the performance of the solution. And here, just to show you an example, this is one of uh, the proposed dashboard that we had for the BGI pilot project in Namibia UN House. And also uh, the KPI analysis that we conducted for the pilot uh, after the, the project was completed. And now just to conclude with this uh, presentation, we wanted to give you the overview of when and uh, how we started these e-mobility efforts 
which started uh, with UNDP Namibia, where we developed this BGI uh, pilot project under this type of technology. Everything started in late 2016 uh, when UNDP and NUVE, which is a Californian based company specialized in the provision of charging infrastructure, we started discussing what role bidirectional electric vehicles combined with solar PV systems could play in creating a more resilient energy supply in UNDP country offices. It was agreed to develop this showcase project in one of the UNDP country offices in Africa and demonstrate the benefits of such a solution. And we decided to focus specifically in Namibia because it was one of the first country offices where our team, ITM, installed a solar system. The setup in Namibia was basically that the solar system was supplying the electric vehicle. The electric vehicle was connected to the charging station, but also it was connected to the building, allowing to store energy in the battery of the electric vehicle to replace the more expensive energy coming from the grid over the night. Nuve, one of the partners, provided the two bidirectional charging station with the aggregators, along with the required expertise and training to install and test the system. And on the other hand, Nissan uh, provided the two electric vehicles. The system was uh, finally inaugurated on the 4th of October, 2019, and was completed last, uh, well, October, 2020, one year later, with a final evaluation where uh, all the stakeholders gather just to discuss the final results and all the lessons learned. The impact that this project had was very, very high, not only throughout the whole uh, lifetime of the project, but especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. At the peak of the pandemic, uh, as you probably know, public transport usage was extremely risky particularly for those colleagues that didn't have any personal vehicles. So the country office, uh, UNDP and UNICEF Namibia, made the decision to use these electric vehicles to provide transportation to all the essential staff to avoid risking exposure uh, to the virus, ensuring in that way that all the country office had all the key staff members uh, ready to continue with the daily operations. Also an interesting point is that since the corporate branding uh, on the cars draw a lot of attention, the country office decided to launch uh, what was called the Spotted Campaign. And with this campaign, citizens around the city were allowed to post pictures of the electric vehicle as they were spotting them around the city in the social media, raising uh, the awareness among the local capacity. This pilot project brought us many lessons learned, as I mentioned before, that we already ensured to include into our process definition. Being the most relevant, the ones you can see listed here, first of all, lack of charging station infrastructure in country, which you all also um, pointed out that is one of the main barriers for this kind of uh, solution implementation. Therefore, it's key uh, to propose and purchase an electric vehicle that is aligned with the conditions and the driving range, uh, and the driving needs, sorry, of the UN cities. For this, it's very important as well to look always at the EV battery capacity, the driving range, and other conditions to make sure that we are selecting the right type of equipment. As well, there was lack of spare parts and technical support in the local market. In this case, uh, for the pilot, if something needed to be replaced or any technical issues happen, it was only possible uh, to be fixed or to be replaced in the Nissan lead dealer in South Africa. So for that reason, it is very important as well to count always with local support and to request all this after sales service always in the procurement process. As mentioned throughout this presentation, our team is fully ready to work with a different number of partners and in collaboration with many different UN agencies. And we can see here a sample of the different ongoing collaborators that we already have the pleasure to work with. And we would like to finish this presentation by showing a mini documentary of the pilot project in Namibia UN House. I don't think we will have time right now uh, to show this video, but we will share later on uh, the link and any other material in case you're interested to take a look. 
And maybe before giving the word back uh, to Luis Diego, uh, Luis Diego, maybe we can display the, the last question. Here is just to have an idea on any future plans uh, you all have in terms of implementation of the mobility solutions. So we are just gonna leave one more minute. Happy to see that um, majority of the cases uh, highly likely or somewhat likely to implement those kind of solutions. So I think uh, that's very good news and thank you so much for uh, responding to those questions. I think we can then move uh, to the next slide and the final one, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so just finally, again, on behalf of the Green Energy team, we would like to thank you all for being present here today. And of course, we remain available to arrange any kickoff meeting for any future engagement in case you are interested in the solution that we have uh, just presented. And now I'm gonna give you the word back, uh, Luis Diego, uh, in case you wanna do any final remarks. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paola, for the presentation. I think it was very complete even with the history of the evolution of e vehicles and the support that your team can, can give. Um, I was going to ask you if you could share that last slide for the implementation of high impact common services. Please. Sure. Um, so you can see some of the, the ways that you're being supported to implement this high, high impact common services. And I think one of the main things um, of having these leverages is that you don't have to start the process from scratch. Some offices that have done it on their own. The learning curve is much higher. There's not that much, um, you know, expertise on the ground. The green you get, that. Um, so you you go with the security that you're going with the best system, um, with the best processes, um, and the highest, not only cost avoidances but also efficiencies. So in the next slide, uh, these webinars are one way um, that you can learn about these services, um, and we've done them globally. If you'd like to have also a webinar specific to your country, we can do that as well. So just reach out either to us or to the green energy team and we'll leave our contacts. You will also have them um, with the follow-up email and you also will have them in the guidance note that I already shared. Um, they're also gonna be tagged as recommended. So when you go into your boss platform, you will know which services uh, you can kind of focus on to have higher impact on your operations. Um, as I mentioned, the practice notes, and also with the seed and pilot um, funding for implementation. So go ahead and reach out to us, especially with, as I mentioned right now, we have funding for the solar solutions and for the visibility inclusion uh, has been taken up, but we can have a, a wait list for the future. So with that, I'll open up the floor for questions. Um, there were two questions in the chat, but feel free to raise your hand. I think this is a great opportunity. We have about 10, 15 minutes uh, to ask questions directly as well. Um, the first question came from Kennedy, and the question was asking, can we have access to this estimation tool for use to state our case with our missions? Hi, and thank you for the question. Maybe I can answer that. So we have to acknowledge that those tools are dynamic and they change every time when there's a change in the market conditions. And obviously we also take into consideration like civil works and electric works required for the installation of charging stations. So at this stage, it's not ready to, for the sharing, but we definitely hope that will be in the future. Great, thank you, Peter. The next question is from Nias. It's asking in many African operations, no grid power. Instead, they, they're using generators. What, what approach would you use for these countries? Thank you. Let me take this one as well, please. So yeah, this is an excellent question because we are actually facing such cases at the moment. And first of all, we definitely recommend that that uh, office have a solar PV installed. Because obviously, if you have solar PV and perhaps have the battery storage, you may have a source of uh, clean energy uh, for to charge the electric vehicle. Otherwise, if you just rely on the generators, it can uh, defeat the purpose of having an electric vehicle. Because obviously, we don't charge it from the clean power source, and, and a generator is not the case. So, solar PV is recommended. 
Yeah, maybe just to complement what Peter has just said, um, you may have seen in other places where there is a smaller solar uh, kind of uh, uh, installation which is dedicated to a which is dedicated to to a charging station. I mean that's much more preferable. Otherwise, if we use the genset, we might actually be polluting more. Uh, would rather use that diesel right inside the engine itself of the car rather than transfer it from genset to to the battery of the car. So if I understood correctly, the countries that are using generators um, may not be recommended to do a, an EV or e-mobility solution. Yeah, I mean, they are recommended as long as they also start or include a small uh, solar installation that is sufficient to power the car. If there is no solar installation and it's just generator, then definitely not recommended. Perfect, thank you, Shatiso. Peter. Um, any other questions, colleagues, feel free again to either raise your hands or put it on the chat. Um, I have a question if, or as we get questions in the chat is, how many country offices are you working with? And what have been some of the main challenges that you've observed as you implement these solutions globally? I can take this one. Um... So right now there are internal UNDP initiatives going on for the implementation of e-mobility solutions. So right now we are working with uh, 19 uh, country offices and we are expecting more uh, to come. Um, we are start, uh, just like in the preliminary stages, collecting information, developing business cases. But so far the main challenges that we have found is um, lack of uh, market readiness. And that's why we are also proposing as part of the pre-assessment step, step one, to conduct market research and have a preliminary contact with those suppliers, just to make sure that we don't uh, have any challenges in the future procurement process. And also a uh, few other challenges we have encountered is that in some of these country offices, uh, the majority of vehicles are used for field mission vehicle. So in those cases, really what we need to try to look is either electric vehicle with uh, high battery capacity or countries with uh, developed charging infrastructure or uh, last option would be to look into plug-in hybrid vehicles just to make sure that at least we have a backup option uh, with the diesel motor just in case uh, we run out of electricity. So I would say that's the main challenges and, and the overview of with how many country offices we are working and what are the, the, the progress. And again, maybe just to complement and add one aspect also to what Paula has said. Uh, for UNDP, the plan for this year is to uh, spend at least 800,000 in this project. So uh, there will be seed money from, from HQ, which is around 800,000. And then the individual country offices will complement that to, so we can easily kind of uh, disperse about a million uh, in, into this kind of uh, project dedicated for EVs only. So that's how kind of uh, big-ish uh, we have started, at least within UNDP. That's how it's going right now. Thank you. Great, thank you. And just to follow up with that, Shatiso, that funding is only for UNDP offices or can it be used also for UN country teams and collaborative efforts? Yes, I should say it's, to, uh, uh, it's for UNDP in the sense that they want, to, it's, it's meant to pay for the UNDP portion. So where we have uh, country, I mean, uh, UN cities coming together and they have a pool of vehicles, I'm sure each agency will be contributing. So UNDP can tap into these funds to use those funds for, for contributing to a common pool of funds for that particular uh, country. Great, thank you. And one question coming in the chat, when is the call for proposals? Or when would that be launched? Yes, there has been uh, some bit of uh, back and forth uh, trying to put the text properly. 
uh, and we are expecting that in a couple of weeks, maybe two, three weeks from now. Uh, but within that time frame, we should actually have the call of uh, call for proposals published. Great. So I'll look out for that in a couple of weeks. And as well, you'll have the uh, Green Energy Team's email and you can also reach out to them for any other advice as well. Another question coming here from, from the chat is, what is the lead time for ITM to conduct the procurement process? Uh, I can take this one. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, as I presented before, it will really depend on the type of procurement modality that we will be choosing, if it's going to be a local uh, tender process or it's going to be uh, using UNDP's LTA or any other existing LTAs that the UNCT could piggyback on. Of course, if it's through an LTA, it's something uh, much faster and, and simple. So it won't take uh, much time. It will be just a matter of uh, doing the request. Then if it's a local procurement process, of course, it will take a bit more time. But then uh, just to give you some uh, general timelines that of course we can go more in detail later when we share the Q&A document. Uh, let's say for the drafting of the terms of reference and publishing uh, the, the, the RFQ through the UNCT local procurement team, that would be maybe like one month. And then uh, for the evaluation uh, of the offers received, it will be something uh, around maybe two weeks. So uh, we are not really talking about much time. It's more like on how much time we are allowing those suppliers to uh, provide their offer and to provide the answers. And then uh, what is the, the response and how fast they are in providing all the documentation and information that we will be requesting. But yeah, we can also uh, provide you with more details in written. Just uh, to add again, maybe just one small caveat to the whole thing is, uh, you know, we have had um, this disruption on the global uh, supply chain and also manufacturing uh, in China and in other places. So there's been a general kind of uh, uh, short supply of the electronic uh, equipment that's required in the manufacturing of these vehicles. And we've heard of uh, some backlogs. We don't know to what extent that could affect us as it were. Uh, we'll be getting into that soon and that will give us a bigger, uh, a clearer picture on the impact uh, in terms of our delivery timelines. But we are hoping uh, it won't be a big impact, but should that be the case, I mean, we always inform uh, the client transparently as we communicate with the, the different parties. And maybe just like a, an addition of what Shatiso um, mentioned, uh, one of the of the of the task that we performed during the pre-assessment during step one, as I mentioned, was a, a market research and reaching out to those potential dealers to see what are. Uh, the services that they can provide and if their equipment align with our expectations. And one of the main things that also we address is this uh, supply um, time timeline to also uh, have very clear the expectations before running into our procurement processes and make sure that this is aligned also with the country of these expectations. Great. Thank you, Paula, Shatiso, and Muna for the question as well. We're coming to the end of the webinar. Um, last questions or remarks for any OMT colleague or anybody that would like to implement the solution but may not know where to start, what would be the next steps that you suggest? So uh, the next steps basically would be to uh, reach out to the email address that I believe it has been shared already in the practice note and also will be in the presentation. Uh, reach out to us, uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions or uh, if necessary, we can also organize a kickoff meeting. We can uh, do a more detailed presentation, more tailored to the specific case of the UNCT, and we can take it from there and discuss the possibilities and how we can collaborate together. But Yatiso, please uh, also uh, jump in in case you have any additional comments. I think that's it. Thank you, Paula.
So I've just put the ITM's email in the chat box as well. And I'll also, we will also be sending the recording and a small survey link. It takes about two minutes. Let us know again how we did. Um, and we're here to support you in every way. That's, um, that's our job, I think, from every angle. So thank you for joining. And we look forward to seeing you in the other webinars. There will be another webinar on Thursday at 10 a.m. New York time. So you're welcome to also, if somebody missed it or you didn't catch the whole webinar, to join us there as well. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Paola, Shatiso, Peter, and the whole Green Energy team for that support and the time in making these services available. Goodbye. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you, Bernard.